we've started a bull market for commodities in the next few years. You must go and check these one by one if you're going to consider an investment in a mining company. On the low end, the central banks themselves believe gold is worth $2,584 an ounce. Hey everyone, welcome back to Yankee Stacking for part two of my interview with Lior Gantz. I know you manage a uh, precious metals mining stock portfolio. Is that right? Uh, a family office. Oh, that's great. What are the main factors that you consider when selecting the right mining stock to include in your portfolio? Okay. Five things, five main things. Okay. One, do you know the person who runs the company personally? Okay. Um, what do I mean by personally? Do, have you researched him enough? Have you seen enough of uh, interviews with him? Have you, have you spoken with him on the phone? So if, unless this is like one of those major conglomerates that are uh, worldwide, and, and in, in that case, you should just own an ETF and that's it. But if you're looking to find, to pinpoint a company that can you know, be uh, beating the, the, uh, the GDX and the GDXJ, you're looking for a company that's specific, I think you should get to know the management as much as you can, as much as you can. Okay. Uh, that's number one. And here's the best way to do that. Why don't you start off with looking for the top 20 CEOs of all time in the mining sector and just stick with them because mining is a commoditized business, right? So in other words, what are all mining companies searching for? They're searching for the same product. There is no difference between this gold and that gold and, and this silver and this silver. It's the same thing. They're selling a commodity. And so the difference, the competitive advantage uh, between one mining company and another is what's between the ears of the people running the company because they know how to make decisions that will be impactful for the shareholders. And there are people that have proven that they're just better. There are people that are great fighter pilots. There are people that are great insurance agents. There are people that know how to run mining companies. And so I would say filter out anyone that's not proven and go for the serial winners. I call them the, the racehorses. Just go for the racehorses. That's one thing. You, you will eliminate 99% of the noise. Okay. You will on, basically, your portfolio will start with about 30 companies um, that, you, that you even look at. Okay. Secondly, look at the underlying assets. And when you look at the assets, think three things. One, will it ever be a mine, unless it's a mine already? Mm -hmm. Will it ever be a mine? One, what is the jurisdiction? Two, uh, what is the jurisdiction? I, I, is it safe enough? Can something happen tomorrow where this thing is going to have a, a big worker strike or a government shutdown or nationals, anything like that? And three, how much work still needs to be done to develop it? Does it need permitting? Does it need, is it in the middle of the jungle, et cetera? Look for easy infrastructure, okay? Easy. And, and if it's already a mine, all of this will be priced in the cost, what we call the AZAC, the all-in sustainable cost. If it's low, great. Um, so that's, that's the second thing, the property, okay? So you got the people and the property, two Ps, right? Um, and then look at the structure of the company. How, uh, how, much, how many shares are out there? And what is the valuation of those shares? You can find a great company, but it's just not an attractive investment. Great example, June 2000, I'm starting to invest. There's this company called Cisco. It controls 90% of the router industry, but it's priced at like 120 times earnings. It never, look at the chart for Cisco Systems. It never recovered to the June 2000 price yet, until today, 21 years later. And so it's, it's astonishing the difference between a great company and a great investment, right? Mm. So look at the valuation. How many shares are outstanding? Does this company issue shares all the time? Does it dilute this share? How, what? Okay, so look at the structure. Who owns it? Are the people that manage it own it? Do they have their own money in this? Because if they don't, bad sign. Okay, so we got four things. And then I would say the fifth thing to look at is past performance. You know, past performance doesn't say anything about the future, but it does actually, right? 
from from a, like a regulatory standpoint, they always tell you past performance doesn't dictate anything, but past performance tells you a lot. If you really think about it, um, if you look at any company uh, and, and you say, okay, what did Jeff Bezos do in the last five years? And then the, the last five years, in the last five years, you know, you get a sense that this guy knows what he's doing. Same thing with stock performance. Look at it. Is this company a solid company? Does it have a good structure? And I think past performance is important. And when you got all these things, I think you have uh, something to look at. That's, uh, that's yeah. excellent. Oh man, wonderful advice from someone who really knows what they're doing. I'm I'm uh, in on some stock uh, mining stocks. I've kind of created what I call the Yankee Quadrant, four factors that I uh, look at when I'm in, looking to invest uh, you know, my hard-earned money in a mining company. And you've touched on, I think, all of them. We may group them a little bit differently. Uh, management, projects, ownership, because I like skin in the game. I like to see who's owning it, right? And the financials, which I think Absolutely. you've covered. But you also said past performance. So again, the financials, what, what the performance has been over time. Those are Phenomenal tips. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. And uh, one other thing, where do you, where do you see uh, the gold and silver mining sector uh, right now? Is it undervalued? Where do you think it's going? Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, in the past 11, 12 years, if you look at the chart of the uh, Toronto Stock Exchange venture, you will see about an 80% decline in price. For, a, for an entire exchange that is severely, severely bearish. Uh, and so we've had a 12 year bear market in gold, gold equities, um, and just Canadian equities in general with a spike in 2016, um, there was an eight month big rally. But apart from that, we have gone down a lot. And so, this 12-year bear market in commodities in general ended in April 2020. Do you remember when a price of one barrel of oil on the options for the, for the future contracts hit a negative $42 a barrel? Do you remember that epic day? Oh, I definitely remember that. That was unbelievable. <laughs> I believe that was the bottom for the 12-year bear market in commodities. And that we've started a bull market for commodities in the next few years. Mm -hmm. And so you look at the price of commodities, copper, nickel, zinc, oil, uh, silver, gold, they're, they're up, they're up, corn, et cetera, they're up. Um, and I think they have more to go. Um, and, and I, you know, ESG is one of them. They're, all these governments are putting so much compliance on these companies. They need to rebuild the forest after they, it's, it's very, very expensive to run a mining company. And um, it, it makes commodity prices go up. You've got dollar weakness, makes commodity go up. You got globalization, commodities going up. You got China and, um, and the states fighting each other in terms of everything technology, IP, intelligence, it's all over. And it's an arms race, makes commodities go up. Um, we're in a great time for commodities. So do you think this is the time to be getting into the right uh, silver or gold and gold uh, mining company? Uh, depending on, on the company, yeah, I believe the, the, you're definitely in a bull market um, in general. Now, gold and silver companies are highly volatile. I would put them at, uh, at one of the most volatile assets that you can own especially if they're small, if they're sub 500 million in market cap, extremely volatile. Sure. There's prices can move if one person wants to liquidate his position because he's getting a divorce and he needs the money. It can move the stock by 10, 20% on a day. And you're like, what's going on? It, it, this stuff happens. So they're very illiquid. Um, and I think uh, you need to really know that company because if you know the company, you can actually call the company. You can say, hey, what's going on? What happened today? You know, walk me through uh, what's going on, et cetera. That personal connection with the company is, is very important. Even an email, it doesn't matter. But having that special connection with the company is, uh, um, is going to help you. Um, in general, if you look at all of the valuation metrics that matter, the S&P 500 ratio to the gold ratio, the S&P 500 to gold equities, gold to gold equities, 
everything points that uh, gold equities are at one of the lowest valuations in um, since they started tracking this in 1942. And let me give you the big one. There have been three big gold bull markets since the, the fiat monetary system started. 1970, the gold production worldwide peaked. Okay, we had what's called peak gold. It wasn't peak gold for the rest of uh, uh, history, but it was peak gold for the next few years, 1970. One year later, Nixon connects, uh, you know, disconnects gold from the dollar. Gold goes up by 2,400% in the next decade. Second time, we have a peak gold situation where global production hit a peak and we're starting to go down. We can't find new gold. We can't uh, replace depleting mines. 2000. From 2000 until 2011, we had an 11 year bull market in gold, never in history as any other commodity or asset class gone up 11 consecutive years. Only gold has done that. And that was between gold uh, between 2000 and 2011, gold went from about 250 to 1900 at the peak. Third time we've had peak gold, 2018. We are now at peak gold. Between now and 2024, gold production is set to half, half. And so we're in a very good position with supply and demand you couple that with the fact that in, in 2019, Basel III made gold a tier one asset, which basically told you central banks believe that whatever the price was on that day, on April 1st, 2019, it's probably double that because that's what they did. They revalued it at double what it was because now it's 50% collateral, it's 100%. On that day, it was 1291 an ounce. So on the low end, the central banks themselves believe gold is worth $2,584 an ounce. Um, and so I think there's a lot of factors here that play into this. Um, but this uh, is a good, but this is probably a great time if you're looking to get into the right precious metal mining company to be considering it. Yes, I believe so. Awesome. I look at the possibility, even if it's small, that at some point, potentially in my lifetime, we really go into not just a uh, a bust, you know, where it might make sense to sell if that is something that you want to do and make a profit, but it may come to the point in which, I mean, this stuff may even be barter material one day, a complete crisis where the dollar is destroyed. So what do you, Absolutely. what's your take on that? You need to, to really think about what happened last year where you saw what happened in Walmarts and in Target stores, et cetera. So exactly. In a real panic, it will get a lot worse. So it's not only about gold and silver. Fine, that, that's a great uh, part of it, uh, of this whole strategy. But if you really think that that kind of a possibility is um, um, uh, realistic, I would say you should also consider um, doing other things as well. In terms of like gold and silver, uh, I think two years the worth of your lifestyle burn rate, a today's lifestyle, lifestyle burn rate, um, it is it is a lot. So it think is. that right. The, 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 think about a family that spends like three three thousand dollars a month. Twenty four months that's seventy two thousand dollars in today's world. If if there's a real panic, seventy two thousand dollars might be a lot of money. Um, and, and so uh, that two years in a depression, it could be six years worth of purchasing power. Or in a in a hyperinflation uh, runaway, you know, reset uh, type scenario. So I think uh, I I am comfortable with that two year that we discussed um, at the beginning of the show, um, especially because I spent a little bit more than three thousand as a firm unit. So I I my, my position is I think I I can manage in that type of environment in terms of my uh, barter ability sure. um, uh, possessions. I also think that it's important to have other means of, of uh, safe haven. So maybe a second passport, maybe uh, another location, like another, uh, a second home, maybe a second home in a different uh, state for, for, for you or, or a different country. Um, I think that connections, other, you know, relationships that you can build where uh, you'd have a lot of uh, um, people that you can uh, connect with in that kind of a scenario. Yeah, There's support a, system. Yes, support absolutely. Support system, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, I, I, I know food, water, yeah. shelter, sure, sure. personal yeah. protection. I actually have a whole series on uh, uh, prepping the Yankee way um, and stacking is to me an important part. 
in that regard, especially the physical. But it may never happen. If it doesn't, no. this may end up in the hands of my children. That's fine. Uh, how, how can people interested in your insights, which you have incredible insights, uh, how, how do they connect with you? Um, wealthresearchgroup.com is the website. There's a, on the home, uh, you can sign up for the newsletter. I think the newsletter is like, um, I think it's the ultimate way to keep tabs with what's going on. When I founded the newsletter, the idea was just that I uh, spent about eight hours a day either talking with companies, um, talking with the hedge fund managers, talking with um, uh, people that are in the, uh, in the investment industry, et cetera. Uh, and then I try to put these notes together for myself. And then I thought maybe I can share those notes. And that's how the newsletter was basically birthed. Wow. Okay. We got to do this again sometime. I feel like I left a lot on the table there with your knowledge. This is fantastic. Thanks again. Pun intended. I know, right? (laughs) Thanks again.